Great. Ah, nothing like a hostile audience to get you excited. <laughs> In case anyone doesn't know me, I'm Steve McMahon, and I'm hoping today that there are no uh, professional sociologists or anthropologists in the audience. If there are, please exit now, <laughs> because I am definitely not a professional. Uh, title of the talk is The Sociology of Open Source Community. And you may wonder why I'm talking about it. Well, if I was trained to, to be anything, it was to be a sociologist. I went to graduate school in sociology in the late 70s and early 80s at Berkeley. That is where I met my spouse. Uh, and one of the things that I read and studied during that time was labor process theory and studies of the labor process. Uh, I had a professor named Michael Burroway, who later became head of the American Sociological Association, who was one of the leaders in that. And labor, source, labor process sociology was always asking why people are doing what they do. The fact that you sold your labor power by the hour doesn't really explain why when you show up at the workplace you actually work. In fact, most people are working for the people around them or they are secretly stealing materials that they're going to take home or any number of things. They're rarely simply working for, for the boss anytime they're working. So I, I want to apply some of those intellectual tools to open source software, and in particular to open source software community. I'm going to be asking a couple of big questions. Why does open source development work? I'm not the first one to ask that question. And the other question is, why do we do it? At least some of the time, why do we do it? Uh, these are very interesting questions. They're worth asking because a lot of open source software, the process of it runs against the common sense of modern society. Our modern economy does not really understand why people would spend large amounts of time, valuable time, on volunteer efforts. They don't understand how projects get maintained or how they get continued. Uh, this is very strongly built into economics and into management theory. Uh, William Garrett, in, let's see, 1968, it's hard to believe that it's been nearly 50 years, uh, wrote an article in which he explained the contemporary understanding of it. He gave it a name. He called it the tragedy of the commons to explain why cooperative use of resources should basically be impossible, why it runs against modern economics, why it couldn't possibly work. This is actually an illustration from his original Science Magazine article. And here we see two, two cows that have trimmed everything else in a field looking at that last daisy that they're getting ready to munch because the two cows couldn't possibly have cooperated in the, the management of the field. Okay, the tragedy of the commons has a couple of major parts to it. One is that in a commons, Garrett thought, everybody will use it too much. So we've got a field, a field of grass that we're going to put cows on, or we've got an oil field that we're going to work, and since there is no cost that is evident to us as individuals when we go to that field, we're going to use it, and we're going to use it, and we're going to use it until there's nothing left of it. Because the cost is all spread around, and we only see a very small part of it. The other part of it is frequently referred to as the free rider problem. Nobody will take care of it. Nobody will take care of it because they don't see a reason to take care of it. They're not paid, to, nobody is paid to maintain the commons. And so the commons is inevitably degraded in the eyes of modern economics. Modern intellectual property rights are based on this understanding. Uh, we in the United States and many other countries have copyright and patent laws that is based upon the idea that unless something can be held as property, unless it can be owned by an individual, that nobody will produce it and nobody will take care of it. In fact, in the United States, we are so sure that you have to give people monopoly rights for creative works that we make sure that those monopoly rights pass not only through the person's life but onto their heir's life. 
A common saying for people who follow intellectual property law is that the copyright on the mouse will never expire. Because every time it appears that the copyright on Mickey Mouse is, is going to expire, Disney goes to Congress and gets the length of copyright law extended. Now possibly, you know, now way past the possible life of anybody that could have ever been involved in originally creating the mouse, the mouse is still copyrighted. So we have an, an interesting process. Disney that is so many times drawn upon a common cultural pool for their uh, movies uh, has owned everything since the beginning of their creation and will never lose the rights to it. Uh, and as I say, the economists think to, that to a large extent things have to be this way because otherwise we'll use these things too much and no one will maintain it. Nobody will create these works for us. Now, if you're a Battlestar Galactica fan, you know it must be true that all of this has happened before and all of it will happen again. So say we all. So say we all. Hard, hard audience. I expected chanting at this point as we came into it. Uh, this is not just a contemporary understanding. I mean, if anybody that studied any, studied any history at all knows that this, that though we didn't call it the tragedy of the commons, that this has been an understanding that's run all through modern economics. And in fact, the beginnings of the modern era were in the end of the commons. Uh, in, in medieval life, in a medieval manner, it was very often true that the peasants who worked the manor shared a commons that they would use between them. If you had a cow, you might take that cow out in the morning and leave it on the commons where it would graze from the grass and so would other neighbors. Other people might be tending crops on the commons. Uh, in fact, up until about the uh, 18th century, most of the land in England, which is of course where we draw most of our, our property rights notions from, uh, was held in commons, in manors, and that was ended by the enclosure acts and the enclosure movements that actually allowed the owners of the manor to erect fences to keep out the peasants. So let's imagine that you are a peasant with a cow, and you one year are able to uh, graze that cow on the commons. You can take it over, feed your cow, and then you milk it at the end of the day. The next, the next year there is a fence, and you are not allowed to take your cow into the commons, and you may in fact have nowhere uh, to run that cow. So where do you end up? Well. Apparently, you end up at the British Olympics, which is where, if for anybody that saw the opening ceremony of the, uh, the Olympics in Great Britain, they actually constructed Engels' satanic mills right out in the middle of the field to actually show the process of people who had been subsistence farmers working the commons, becoming landless, going to the cities to live, and finding themselves working in great uh, great factory organizations, the smokestacks that built the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in the US, we have another example that is sort of built into our DNA, and that is the, uh, the changes that took place in the frontier. If you find just about any Western movie, there's a very good chance that the plot is going to have to do with uh, people who ran cattle in an open range becoming frustrated as fences are going up to protect land where farmers are now putting up their houses and growing small plots of land and the land is actually owned. That was our equivalent of the enclosure movement, although our enclosure movement did not create great industrial working classes as did the British one. We didn't have a lot of subsistence farming for that to happen. When it happened in Britain, it was a, a tremendous change and it was a change that occurred with great pain and great resistance at the same time. And this is, uh, there were several social movements that began uh, from it. Uh, there were rural social movements and urban ones. One of the most famous rural ones was called the Diggers, and its great spokesperson who wrote quite a bit, who's also called a leveler, was George Wynn Stanley, and this is a quote from him. England is not a free people till the poor have no, that have no land have a free allowance to dig and labor the commons. 
I mean, you can hear the rage behind that, and that rage was backed by action. The diggers actually went into formerly common fields, now enclosed, and they got out their spades, and they dug in common and tried to share the produce of it, and were, in general, run, run off by, uh, by the military of the time. The urban equivalent would be Paul's house. Actually, there would be many urban equivalents, including modern socialism. But also, in, in Amsterdam, people who saw empty houses and moved into them, they would be the equivalent of the diggers. So let, let's take a look at that quote from George Wynn Stanley again. I mean, you can probably hear the, some of the rage behind it. Now, does this remind anyone of, a, of any contemporary figures? I mean, you could be naming Larry Lessig. I'm wearing a Creative Commons t-shirt. But let's fiddle with that a little bit. The world, not just England, is not a free people. Till the poor that have no intellectual property have a free allowance to read and use the source, the code. So who's, who's the figure? Richard Stallman. And, 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 and this, is the, this has all happened before and will all happen again. I mean, you can hear that rage that rage at what was once a common resource that you were allowed to work, to till, that was becoming a private resource that you couldn't use any longer. For Stallman, that was wrapped up in the history of Unix. Uh, AT&T was under antitrust uh, judgments in the United States, and it wasn't allowed to do anything outside of the telephone business. AT&T had large intellectual property holdings. They'd written a lot of code. Unix was being developed there. And AT&T, for trivial cost, licensed Unix to universities all over the United States, particularly including MIT and the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and people developed it there. And generation, you know, a whole generation of graduate students cut their teeth on writing parts of Unix. They built tools for it. They worked on the kernels. And Unix very rapidly uh, got much better. And then AT&T, the, the world was changing, began to flex its, flex its muscles again, and tried to take back Unix. And it sued the University of California, Berkeley, tr trying to prevent the University of California, Berkeley from, from distributing its own contributions to Unix. Stallman is right in the middle of this. Stallman has been involved in working on Unix, and Stallman has been involved in helping build tools for it. And he was personally outraged. For him, this was a second enclosure. And by the way, it was called that at the time. Many people pointed out the similarities to the enclosure movement. This was an enclosure of intellectual property that had been seen as a commons before. And Stallman's reply was to build a Unix that was not Unix, a Unix that was not encumbered by AT&T's intellectual property rights so that Richard Stallman and his friends and his contemporaries could read and work the source unhindered by intellectual property law. Uh, later on, that attempt to write Unix, which actually it, was never completely finished, and it, but different efforts became BSD, Unix, and Linux. Uh, the, it, it spawned the GNU public license, which we work with today, which Plone is licensed under today, and the Free Software Foundation, which sort of manages, uh, is the trustee for the GNU public license and develops it and turns out the various versions of it. Uh, another ideologist. I think, I think of Richard Stallman as being an ideologist for free software. Another ideologist of that movement was Egben Moglen, uh, Eben Moglen. And Eben spoke at the first US Plone conference. And there's Paul Everett, there's Paul Rowland, there's Hanno Schlichting in Seattle watching that. Uh, and that talk is, by the way, still available, and it was a real a summation of a certain part of the argument uh, for free software. And uh, Stallman emphasized in particular the right to read and work the source. M Moglen emphasized the fact that in the production of software, in the copying of it, 
there is nearly no marginal price. It costs nearly nothing to duplicate software once it has been created. Since it costs nearly nothing, how, he said, can we withhold it from anybody that needs it? I mean, software may not be food, but software manages the production of food. If it's essentially free to reproduce the software, if it is essentially free to reproduce books that tell us how to, how to grow food, how do we deny that to needy people? So free software in this argument is not a resource that can be destroyed by overuse. Remember the tragedy of the commons that I was talking about? There were two parts of, of that tragedy. One was that people will use things up, that they will overuse them. They won't see the value of them, they will overuse them, and they will destroy it. With free software, that really can't take place. It's no matter how much we use it, we don't deplete it. So that takes care of one part, the overuse part of the tragedy of the commons. But the tragedy of the commons still has other parts. Who's going to take care of it? So we can reproduce the software freely, but who creates the software? Who maintains the software? And why do they do it? And that, that question wasn't really answered by Stallman, other than through his personal curiosity, or by Moglen. But we did get a great explanation of this from Eric Raymond, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And it's a collection of essays that were written all about the same time, and a lot of it's about Unix and Linux culture. And I'll bet several people here have read one or another part of the cathedral in the bazaar. Any hands up for that? Yeah, we've got lots of hands up for that, at least. I mean, it's a really fantastic, very readable piece of work. Uh, that was written by Eric S. Raymond. I, I think of Eric Raymond as being the first intellectual of the open source uh, software movement. And what I mean by intellectual here was that he was a person who explained our position in the world, our being the people, those of us who are working on open source software. He universalized it. He explained how we fit into the larger economy and tried to explain why, what, why we do what we do, the sort of classic role of the intellectual. Uh, he was also quite a quirky guy. <laughs> He was a gun nut, uh, and I think it's fair to use the word nut and not just a gun advocate for, this, for his particular case. Uh, but he was extremely well-spoken. He was very widely read. Uh, he was particularly widely read in libertarianism. And he was the, the popularizer of the term open source, which he offered up as an alternative to Stallman's free software, in part because he thought the term free was misleading, and in the English language it is a pretty misleading term. It doesn't capture what he was after. So uh, Raymond, in any case, in this series of essays that he wrote, asked the question, uh, why, or asked the questions, why does open source work and why do we do what we do? And I'd like to talk for a moment about some of his answers. His biggest point is that open source software is a gift economy. And gift economy is a term taken from sociology and anthropology. A gift economy is one in which you have exchange but without contract, without bartering, without any sureness that what you're giving away is going to be returning to you. So you, you offer up the gift to other people. You hope that it will be returned, but it will not necessarily be returned. So in this picture, People like Linus Torvald or Richard Stallman are giving. They're offering up into the larger economy gifts, creative acts that they've made. And then hopefully, patches and additional parts come back to them. Somebody, somebody writes a tape archive piece of software. Somebody else writes uh, TROF so that we can all put out journals with it. And that all drifts back into the project, and the project becomes greater. Uh, since Eric Raymond was a great fan of the free market, and he was, a great he was a great libertarian, he wanted, though, to be able to explain how the gift economy could work in a modern economy. He wanted to give an economic rationale for how it would work and how it could produce great works. 
His basic explanation for that was what he termed Linus's law. And I'm not absolutely sure whether it was Linus Torvald who first said this or whether it was Eric Raymond who rephrased him and said it. Does anybody around here know for sure? But Linus's law is that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Which is to say, if you've got an awful lot of people looking at a piece of software that you've put out, and those people are involved in the project and they're contributing back, someone is going to know how to fix the problem if you put it out there. The creator may not know how to fix the problem, but somebody out there, when you've got thousands and thousands of users, is going to be able to help with the problem. That, by the way, that help is not necessarily the patch that fix it, fixes it. Maybe it's the bug report that tells you a better way of doing something. Or maybe it's the bug report that centers things in so, so well that the original, uh, original creator can fix it. Or it's the report that comes back and says, we need it to do this thing, and you see why, and that helps you make it better than it ever could have been before. So that Linus's law captures, again, this is, this is Eric Raymond, uh, the idea that the only limiting resource in our modern economy is skilled attention. We're in an attention, in, in an attention uh, economy. In that attention economy, if you can give something away and lots of people look at it and lots of people as a result help you improve it, then a lot of attention is going into it and you'll get improvements that you could not get otherwise. So in the attention economy and in something like software, there is great future value in giving away a creation. You give it away, other people try to use it, and then things come back to you that give it a value that you never had before. So in that world, why would you ever keep software if you thought that people could use it? Because if people are going to use it and you get it out there, it becomes improved. Because of the fact that it gets improved, you can move faster. You can innovate faster than you ever could before. And so, in Eric Raymond's mind, open source software ought to be, in its creativity, able to uh, solve problems that could not be solved by huge engineering projects like that that produced Microsoft Windows. And uh, the final story is not written yet, but clearly, to a certain extent, open source does do this and does do this pretty well. So uh, Eric Raymond then gave us a pretty good idea of how a certain kind of project would work. He didn't imagine that it would cover everything. There's still individual acts of creativity. Uh, Michelangelo's David, for example. Uh, the Disney's Mickey Mouse. I mean, the, the things that basically come initially from an individual, a creative individual. What Brian was talking about design, really, really good design earlier the design of a project that gets it moving. Those are singular creative acts. That's not really what we're talking about here. Instead, we're, we're really talking about the economy of maintenance. You put out a creative work that you want to get better over time. For most large works of software, most of the expense comes in the maintenance. And with open source software, we're in a sense socializing the maintenance. We're putting a lot of eyes on it. So, Fork me on GitHub works in open source software, though it probably wouldn't have worked very well for Michelangelo. Okay, uh, Eric Raymond was, was, that was the economics. That was why the economics of open source worked. The idea was this future value from a gift economy. You give something away, and in the future, it comes back to you better. He also, though, wanted to get at uh, individual motivation not just why open source would work in a free market economy, but why open source software developers would do the work that they do. And Eric Raymond's answer to that was, in gift cultures, social status is determined not by what you control, by what you give away. He imagined a sort of reputational economics where the, the motivation of the individuals working in the software would be reputation building up your own reputation. And in his mind, that was why we maintain change logs, so that we can get the names on it to show who's done the individual work. And your, your reputation would grow with your contributions to a project, and you would feel all puffed up and better and sure that you were better than other people. And that was why we would, that's why we do it, to become famous in Eric Raymond's mind. Uh, 
And this is, this is why, in, Eric, in Eric's mind, uh, Eric Raymond's mind, the uh, hoarding, not, not passing on the gift, not improving it, would be a real taboo because you've taken something that is somebody else's reputation, somebody else's creativity, and you've kept it to yourself rather than giving back to it, rather than acknowledging the, the value of their contribution. So Eric Raymond thought that it was completely unnecessary to talk about altruism or really anything social other than reputation. It was just the feeling of power that we got over others by doing the work in order to, to uh, answer the question of why we do open source software development. Now that, that poses some interesting problems. And here I have a fairly lengthy quote that is from the end, end of one of uh, Eric Raymond's essays where he's talking about open source software, where it becomes really completely clear he doesn't understand why community projects work at all. So he wrote, my understanding of large projects that don't follow a benevolent dictator model is weak. He thought that the reputation of the benevolent dictator was all that could possibly lead a project and help it move along. You know, that reputation uh, that came from the creativity embodied in the gift they gave away. Most such projects fail that he wrote. I mean, this may well be true, but the fact is most open source projects fail. I mean, in the sense of being, not finally being maintained. The percentage must just be unbelievable for open source projects. I mean, we, th we throw out things all the time. Some of them stick to the wall, but the, the vast majority don't. A few projects become spectacularly successful. So he knew that something was going on out there but nobody really understands where the difference lies. So he, he understood that, that his reputation economics didn't really explain certain kinds of open source projects. And, uh, he, but basically he said, These are, they're weird. These are weird projects. I don't understand why they work. And he really didn't concern himself very much. Now, we in the Plone community are, are really in a great position to talk about these particular questions. I mean, we are a community-based project. And while we may not own the world and may not even own the content management system world, we are still an immensely successful open source project by the, by, when measured up against open source pro other open source projects. Just pulling some of the OLONET statistics, I mean, we are and we have been for years in the top 1% of all open source projects in terms of our, of our rate of commits and our number of contributors. Uh, we are very long-lived. Plone has been around long, longer than a great many other projects. I mean, you know, in, term, in terms of length of life, we're only a little ways behind projects like Apache. Uh, we've moved into a second and even a third generation of developers that are coming on after the original founders. Our founders are gone. Uh, you know, Al Alan and Alex are not here, and they were never really benevolent dictators for life anyway. I mean, uh, Alex Leamy did not manage our project. Alex Leamy. Uh, you know, concerned himself a lot with the particulars of the design, and he caused a lot of trouble for whoever the release manager was around the time the release came. But he really didn't have a large, much to do with other large parts of the project. And Alan got, you know, Alan and Enfold were doing their own thing. They were concerned with Windows and also were, were never contributing a lot of code. They certainly never gained veto power over the, the project. So we're... We're sort of like an or orphan project or one that never even had parents at all, but yet we continue. So how do we explain an open source community project? I mean, it's, we certainly can't explain its organization through the reputation of the managers. Well, remember that the term gift economy came from sociology and anthropology. I mean, that's where, that's where uh, Eric Raymond got it. And in fact, sociologists and anthropologists use the term gift economy or gift culture very, very differently than Eric Raymond did. Eric Raymond cited this from sociology, 
But I, I don't know if he either never read the original sources or if his libertarianism just simply wouldn't allow him to accept it. But the, in any case, there's a very rich tradition that's been used for a very long time. The first uh, sociologist to use the term of gift economy was Marcel Mauss, the very great French sociologist and, and one of the founders of anthropology. Uh, he wrote a book in 1925 called The Gift. It is now accept, generally accepted by anthropologists that the gift cultures that he described in it have characterized probably the majority of human history. Not necessarily the majority of people, since the majority, of, you know, about half the people who are ever, ever lived or alive right now, but long portions of particularly pre-written history that went, uh, we think can, now can best be characterized as being gift cultures. There wasn't a great deal of barter. There were, very li there were no contracts, in fact, it was even before writing, yet large amounts of exchange actually took place. Okay, Maus wrote in describing this, in any society, it is the end of the gift to be its own reward. Not necessarily the reputation that comes from it, but actually the giving of the gift itself. Now, how did he explain this? His, his main point was that giving away a gift and receiving a gift establishes a social relationship. It creates reciprocity. And if you have a pattern of that that goes on over a period of time, you have a community, you have a society, and you have a culture. And they can be built from these exchanges, these exchanges that tie together, that create feelings of obligation between individuals. And the, so the role of the gift is not necessarily in its simple economics, that you may be needing very much what I gave you, but rather in the fact that the exchange has taken place, and thus it helps establish through those obligations that we are a community, we are a society, that you may owe me a favor, that I may owe you favors, that I know where you live and can find you, that if I've got a qu nasty question about cashing, that I can ask Nathan Van Geem, because I know him, and we've done favors for each other in the past, and that builds a collective capacity in the community that would not have existed without those exchanges. Now, in I, I reread the gift. Uh, I think I read it back during graduate school, but I reread the gift to get ready for this talk, and one of the things that struck me about uh, that text was the ways in which uh, Mauss's description of the gift really paralleled the GNU public license. So he writes, the gift is given only on the condition that it will be used on behalf of or transmitted to the third person, the return party. So if you accept and work on GPL software, you've got the obligation to pass that on. You, you can't receive that gift without having that obligation. So the, uh, the, the giving has an implication with it. And also, the gift is at the same time dangerous to receive. The GPL is viral. You receive a piece of GPL software, you are, you are getting social obligations with that software. You, uh, you, you are now part of a society, in a sense. You've been connected by the, by the receiving of the software. You're part of a set of obligations. Now, this <laughs> plays out in plum. Some of you will recognize this. This is a picture of, a, of the slogan from a t-shirt. Uh, Kapil Thangavalu, I've never been able to pronounce his name correctly, and I'm probably mangling it now, uh, years ago came up with this phrase to describe the way the Plone community kept pulling him back in, in the words of the Godfather. Uh, and then uh, Tarek Ziade uh, created a t-shirt, which he brought several of them to the Washington DC conference and gave out in return for uh, a group of us having volunteered to, to pay Tarek's way to come to the conference. We gave him a gift and he gave us t-shirts back. Uh, and it's still, I think, let's see, who, who all here's got one? I know Calvin's got one, I've got one. Are we the only two? Paul, do you not have one? Well, 
<laughs> okay, so now we, know who the, now we know who's got the biggest reputation in this audience. We've got those t-shirts. Uh, Th that sort of exchange is, is uh, I mean, we know about these things in this community, and it pulls us back in. It makes it hard to leave, because there's always some obligation that's unfulfilled. I also think that in terms of the way we're played out, sprint culture, what happens at sprints, is absolutely vital to the, to the way this reciprocity works. Uh, many of the commentators on Mouse, uh, one of the criticisms for it is that uh, criticisms people made of him is that he spoke of the gift very generally and didn't take specifics into account. One of those specifics was whether the gift was anonymous or whether it was being passed between people who know each other. And later anthropologists came to believe that anonymously given gifts really don't have the same sorts of obligations at all. The obligations are established when you know the people, when there is an exchange in which you actually see the other people going on. I think that that breaking of anonymity is one of the key things that we do at sprints. We establish who each other are, we see each other's faces, we make it possible to ask those favors that would be very hard to ask of an anonymous person. If you've just contributed a, uh, a patch to something later on, that really doesn't necessarily allow you to grab someone in an IRC channel, take it private, and ask them a nasty caching question. But when I've met Nathan, for example, sorry to be picking you out, Nathan, uh, you know, when we've worked together, when we've talked at, at uh, sprints, uh, and we've exchanged patches of each other's code, then it's a lot easier to ask those questions. So we get an economy of favors as well as the patches and the acts of creativity. So it, we are nuts for sprints in the Plone community. I, I mean, basically the term sprint was coined by the Zope community out of which we grew. Uh, other communities talk about things like hackathon, but it doesn't really necessarily mean the same thing because sometimes they're competitive. I mean, a sprint would never be competitive except for who gets the bottle of whiskey at the end. Uh, and the, these are, uh, some of these may be out of date, but these, these are pretty much the sprints that have occurred during the past year. And every one of these has brought people together face by face, sometimes five people, sometimes 40 people, who see each other's faces, look at each other's code, and d develop social relations between one another. And somebody will, I hope, later do an anthropology of our community in which they will explain why so many are named after food and drink. <laughs> okay, uh, back to Marcel Mauss. Uh, this is a quote from him. And he, he's talking about Potlatch, which was the, the great festival gathering of giving that took place among the uh, Northwest Indians in the United States. Uh, and he found examples of potlatch, by the way, in several other cultures. But he, he wrote, in the things exchanged at a potlatch, there is a certain power which forces them to circulate, to be given away and repaid. And those, uh, those of you who haven't been to sprints may not recognize this, but you, those of you who've been to sprints, isn't there that feeling in the air of the, in what you're doing in a sprint? that, you, that you, you could not possibly take private what is done at a sprint. What is done at a sprint belongs to the community. It is a social thing. It needs to be passed out to the larger community. And also, it belongs to everyone there. Everybody's going to be able to continue to work on that afterwards. So this is a visualization that was done uh, after the mosaic sprint, which just very recently took place by Asko Suko. And in this, you see people. Right now we've got somebody bouncing around a person. And then the little, the little circles are nodes of code, pieces of code that are being worked on. This visualization represents checking in of code that's been worked on. Somebody's gathered up a piece of code, they've made an improvement to it, and they're checking it back in, committing it into the system. We'll speed up. This only lasts a couple of minutes, by the way. But look, it's beginning to get complicated and really, in a certain way, beautiful. So we've got several people at the sprint. They're all working. They're jostling around, working at one, on one piece of code after another. You can probably imagine them 
sidling up to one another, moving from chair to chair, asking people questions, sitting next to someone who knows a particular piece of code as they worked on it. Now, to a sociologist, this kind of visualization is very familiar. It's a network diagram. It is a network of, uh, or it is a diagram of a social network that we use to talk about how communities are maintained and the relationships in communities. So I don't know the software that ASCO used to do this, but isn't that beautiful? I, I really love the way that looks. So the, the uh, larger point I'm trying to make is that the, the work that we are doing, the working on these, these pieces of code from a sociological or anthropological perspective is social relations. I mean, we're, we're looking at these creative works that we each do. We're sharing them. We're commenting on them. They're bouncing back and forth. Uh, we can't do these things without establishing relations to one another. When we establish those, we establish obligations, and we need to return them to the community later on. And we also get t-shirts for them. <laughs> and those t-shirts are practically fetishized. I mean, the really, my really good plown t-shirts are very carefully folded up in my closet. And I'll bet that that is true of others. We've all got collections. and when. And if there's any uh, real reputation jostling in these communities, it's, it may be wearing the most obscure possible t-shirt out of Plone history to a sprint. So this is back to the 2006 Plone conference. Once, once again, we've got larger than life Paul Rowland up here, but also Paul Everett. And Paul Everett uh, had a description where, uh, of the way Plone worked where he said, the software is the artifact of the community. And he said that to emphasize the community's importance and the fact that Plone the software is a gift from and a gift to the community. I think that the opposite also holds if we're taking this sort of sociological, anthropological perspective. The community is an artifact of the software. The software is giving us, the, the software is the thing that is getting exchanged, the source code is getting exchanged between us, and that is building the community. We all enjoy working together, but we would not have found each other and we would not be continuing to do this work that we enjoy doing together if we didn't have the software that puts it together. The software also strikes at the, the uniqueness of intellectual property the way it is now because we can make a living working on this software as well as engaging in this community. And so we can combine our avocations, our hobbies that we enjoy and that bring us together in community with, with our work, uh, with what gets us employed. And it doesn't always work, and communities come and communities go, and we know people leave our community when they find that they can't uh, make a living inside it doing what they've been doing before, or another more exciting project gives them. But still, the project has remarkable life, and new people continue to find it and enjoy it. Let me just check the time here. I'll, I'll try and get the next bit quickly, so if anybody's got questions, they can ask them. I've been painting a very rosy picture, but obviously there are challenges, too, uh, to this community of ours. And we've talked about some of them during this conference. One of them, and I don't think we've talked about this too much, a real danger that this can fall to is uh, homogeneous culture. Uh, the, the mechanisms that I'm talking about that are used to build community are fundamentally the same as the social relations of archaic societies. And they generally work by creating insiders and outsiders and by defining the limits. And while we may not be attempting to establish who has the, the best reputation, we certainly have notions of who is a good coder and who is not a good coder, who should be allowed to touch the core and who cannot who better put in a pull request before they do something, or who might be allowed to commit fairly directly. And that's all informally maintained. Now, that sort of informal, community-based, insider-outsider social relations can yield an environment in which, essentially, everybody comes to look pretty much the same. Because it can value a... Uh, a very, or it can have in mind a very one-dimensional meritocracy where there's only one value of success. And very, very soon, 
if not in appearance, in attitude, we come to, to look like Linus. So say we all. Very, very scary slogan. Well, let me bounce back to Eric Raymond. And I, I bumped in, reading, rereading his work, bumped into another quote, something he was very proud of. Open source has been successful partly because its culture only accepts the, t the most talented 5% or so of the programming population. I mean, in my mind, that is an amazing quote. That is somebody saying, we have a homogeneous culture, and we're proud of it, and we work to maintain it. I mean, uh, let's start, first of all, with programming. I mean, a modern project needs so much more than programming. I mean, we need documentation. We need people who think about how to explain this to people outside of the community. We need, uh, we need graphic designers. We need C CSS and usability people who don't think of themselves as coders at all. Eric Raymond's basic picture is Linux. He is completely leaving out a project like ours that is very concerned with uh, accessibility, clear documentation, uh, usability by any number of people. Uh, how can we be successful in the modern internet if we all look like Linus? So I'm going to give us Linus's law restated. And I'm not the first to say this. Linus said, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Well, the eyeballs have to be different. They have to be different people who look at different what, things different ways if a project is to be really successful. And so these tools that build community, if they are maintaining too much homogeneity, are really limiting the possibilities of the software. And I think we can think about that and we can see some of the problems that we've had getting other people in the community, getting really talented designers, getting good CSS people. Uh, we're, we're a coding culture. We're not as bad as many projects in that respect, but we really need to think about it and to be aware of it. Back to dead sociologists. Uh, Emil Durkheim was the, uh, was the teacher and the mentor of Marcel Mauss. He was a uh, late 19th, very early 20th century sociologist, a uh, very great French sociologist, and also widely considered to be the, the founder of modern anthropology. And Durkheim had some, I think, very interesting things to say about this problem in his book, The Division of Labor and Society. He divided between two ways of organizing communities and organizing societies. One he called mechanical solidarity. And mechanical solidarity is the solidarity of sameness. It creates hom basically homogeneity. It uses social pressures and filtering, uh, defining who's inside and who's outside to maintain the solidarity of a community. Organic solidarity is instead the solidarity of the modern world. It is the solidarity of the marketplace and the political system. Where, a, where diversity and difference can, can thrive. I would say that inside the kind of community we are building, we need both kinds of devices. We need the sprints, the face-to-face -face activities, some of the cultural standards, but we also are going to need some of those devices of modern societies if we're to have the, uh, the differentiation of abilities, the difference that will allow us to have different kinds of people working on the project. I think we can see the conflict between those two kinds of solidarity playing out in our own communities. I'm gonna recap a recent incident that took place on the Plone IRC channel. I'm changing some of the phraseology and I'm most certainly changing the names involved. Uh, but I think many of you nonetheless will recognize the incident. Okay, we have a, a newbie who actually had a name, was a person known, who asked a really bad question. And by a really bad question, I mean one that could not possibly be answered. One that, that, would, that was basically demanding that of his listeners that they, that they ask him 20 questions to figure out what his problem really was. And at the end of an, of an exchange of that variety, one of our old hands wrote back, <laughs> the usual <laughs> ignorance, and what I've taken out there was an ethnic slur. And the, person, the, the, newbie, was in, the newbie was indeed of that ethnicity, and so our, our old hand was characterizing a whole 
actually a whole nation of the world as being ignorant. And the next thing that happened was that the old standby member of the community got kicked and banned. I did that. Uh, I, think after, I think after Eric Steele called him on it, actually, and then tried to make clear to everyone there that, that it was something that could be discussed. I, and this was a very painful thing to do. Okay, Eric, one of Eric Raymond's essays was how to ask smart questions. And Eric Raymond basically said uh, the community upholds itself. It keeps itself together. It keeps itself functional by demanding that people ask good questions, by forcing people out of the community who cannot learn to ask good questions. When I uh, wrote with our old hand about this, he was mad at me because he thought he was enforcing community standards. He was keeping the signal to noise ratio in the channel high, more signal than noise, by trying to discourage a newbie who is asking bad questions. So he was, if you will, the voice of mechanical solidarity, trying to define inside and outside in the community, to keep the, the community functional. I, on the other hand, was the voice in, of the, the voice that was saying, hey, how are we ever going to get, uh, you know, other nations to use this package? How are we ever going to have new people come into it if we behave like this, if we dismiss whole groups of, of people this way? Uh, and though I, I still think that the person I'm labeling, I, labeling IRC veteran was quite a cad in this case, I think that this is a real conflict, and it will always be a conflict in our, our community. How we can maintain a feeling of community while not drawing sharp inside-outside boundaries that exclude large groups of people. One of those large groups of people that I don't think we can afford to exclude are women, who are uh, historically, they have been so far uh, much lower participants, much lower percentage participants in open source projects than in software in general. This uh, disgusting slide was uh, from a talk at a Ruby conference in 2009, and the slides got worse from there. And it, it formed quite a controversy in the community. And then uh, one of the things that was really unfortunate about this is he got, he got called on it. He had people say, you know, this is awful. You know, we tried to get women to come to this conference, and look what you did. You put, you put up slides of new women and talked about pornography in your talk. Unfortunately, the Rails community, to a certain extent, circled the wagons around this guy who was one of their main contributors because they felt they couldn't afford to lose him or alienate him. Also, let's look at his own explanation after the fact uh, as to, to what he was doing and why he thought it wasn't so much of a problem. I would have hoped that people who were likely to be offended would have simply chosen not to attend my talk or read my slides on the internet. Now, what he was trying to say was, hey, hey, this is all fun between us. Not a problem. You know, we don't want people who get offended easily. We're a bunch of, we're a bunch of bros. We all are part of the same fraternity. And he's also, he's also saying that anybody that would feel excluded by that, that would feel bothered by that, shouldn't be part, essentially shouldn't be part of the community. They shouldn't be coming to a conference, and they shouldn't be, be showing up at his talks. And uh, so I think you can also see there, I mean, I think you can see the workings of mechanical solidarity. He is saying, hey, hey, we're, we're a bunch of bros. We were part of the same fraternity. We, that's how we maintain ourselves. We want to be able to have fun. We don't want to have to watch what we're saying. Well, the fact is, if we're going to be in a diverse community with all sorts of people participating from all around the world, and if we want to lure in talented people that are not in our community yet, we are going to have to watch what we're saying. We can't just pretend that we're all members of the same fraternity. Okay, another, another challenge. A community built on the kinds of mechanisms we are is going to have problems with strategic action. And Brian was pointing some of this out. I don't know if you use this, the term strategic action or not. But uh, we, we've got problems doing things strategically. We have a problem with secrecy. I mean, secrecy is corrosive to a community. We have a security team that largely needs to function in secret. 
every once in a while we will go through a sort of convolution at the com of the community where people will be upset at sort of the high handedness of por uh, portions of the security team. I, I have no immediate solution for that. I think it's in a sense built into the problems we have. We have problems doing roadmaps. Because doing a, doing a roadmap would say that you, you volunteers should be working on what I say you should be working on. And inevitably, when we try to do a roadmap, people bristle at it. Nonetheless, we've actually had some pretty good roadmap documents. We just had to get the right people working on them. And they had to be political documents that involved a lot of people. Also, we, we have trouble advancing goals that require tedious work that's not much fun for programmers. Uh, and one, the solution of some communities to that would be, well, just pay people for the tedious work. But in fact, there's a huge problem of mixed motiv motivation. When you've got a lot of people volunteering for a project, you really can't start paying people for certain kinds of work and not have that become corrosive to the community. You can't have some people working on an open market, you're getting paid because we value your work economically, and other people, well, does that mean we don't value your work? And the, in fact, the only person that the Plon Foundation pays is the release manager. And I think it is, you know, that it is no more than a token to cover some of the, the work he does. And, to, and it's practically a greeting card to say how much we appreciate his effort. It's so small. In fact, I think it's a much bigger reward to Eric that the, that the Plon Foundation says, you're our best ambassador. We want you anywhere we'll, where you will go, and we will pay for your travel to do it. So, other challenges in there. Now, I, am, I am pretty much done here, but I want to end from, with a quote from God, or at least one God. Uh, this is from one of the oldest texts of the Western tradition, the Eddas, Odin speaking. No, if you have a friend in whom you have sure confidence and wish to make use of him, you ought to exchange ideas and gifts with him and go to see him often. Well, we should, be able, we should say him and her, but I'm happy to say we do see each other often, and I'm happy to be seeing you here today. And there, there it is. There's the Sociology of Open Source Community from Steve McMahon. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions, abuse, whatever, from this very hostile audience. And you don't even have to cite French sociologists. The Germans can get equal time. Yes. No? Nope. I'm just hand waving. OK. Oh, Chris. If you've got anything long, otherwise I'll just repeat it. Uh, so I hate to bring this one up, but um, IRC veteran um, has concerned me for a long time. And uh, uh, it's not so much, I, you know, I understand um, about um, wanting to keep up a quality of discourse in the community. And certainly, people do need to um, be able to phrase the proper question and being shown maybe some document about how to, to um, ask a proper question is not um, entirely inappropriate. Um, it's more that, um, that we, in, in place of doing that, um, throw out insults at people, and I just, and it's always a thing that um, that's that same sort of justification every time for doing it. And I don't know um, if we can't educate this person to okay, if you can't say something nice, just don't say anything at all, and it would perform the same purpose in his mind. If we well, can. many of us have tried with this particular person. But I, something I actually meant to make a little part of the part, a little com common thing about the internet and about open source software. So I think this is a quote from somebody. Cens uh, censorship is perceived as damage, and it's worked around. The, um, we, our community is, there's also a corrosive effect to what we perceive as censorship. And so we need to walk delicate lines. Uh, there were people who regarded the chastising of this guy from the Ruby conference as censorship. There are people who perceive attempts to control IRC veteran as censorship. He cer absolutely certainly perceives it that way himself. Uh, the, um, I mean, I, the, for, I apologize to those of you who were being cute and talking around names, but the names aren't really that important, in fact. My, my larger point is I think 
it helps us to be sensitive about the contradictions here. It helps us to think this is, this is not just an asshole. This is an asshole who has a justification that is part of open source culture. And that we're, that we, we can't, okay, we may eventually, we may have to occasionally kick and ban him, but we really need to recognize that contradiction in the community also. You bet, Nathan. Nathan, who's also fought IRC veteran on various occasions. I, I think as a community, we can take care of it if we, if we be more proactive with the newbies and uh, don't let him pounce on them, I guess. Yeah. Because, um, it's really absolutely the best it's answer. Usually, it's usually, it usually happens when there's a void and everyone's just like s sitting there and he's like, oh, this guy doesn't have an answer. I feel like giving him something or whatever. Um, so that's just. And right, and that's also, that's, the, that's a great answer because it's not saying he's absolutely 100% wrong. I mean, he's done a lot of code for the community. It, it, it is saying it is our duty to welcome the newbies, to get out there, to help them figure out what their questions are, uh, to be sensitive to cultural differences, and you know, recognize that, that, that he is also a cultural difference inside the community. Kurt, did you have something? Right, it's true, it's true. So if we jump in, he'll be quiet. I've been known to take newbies into a private conversation just to get them out of the way. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So uh, I would like to postulate that it might not be a bad idea to have a benevolent dictator for life, um, as long as we have a benevolent dictator, which can be tricky. Yeah. But um, sometimes I wonder if if um, our Diminishing numbers are not only due to you know other cool technologies coming around, but you know maybe there's could be some more direction that's maybe not by committee. It seems to me that whenever I see any study that says we've we've created something, we've done it by committee, and it has always been less effective than than something that's had more direction. Got any uh, feedback opinions on that? I'd love well, to challenge this I, idea. Sometimes I, I think yes, there's you know how am I going to yeah. somebody to work on code? if I'm dictating that. But then again, if we have a direction, it I mean, might be I easier to get around. It's, it's hard to create a benevolent dictator for life because we need one. Right, and, and I, I see that also. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tremendous problem. But, but also, let me, let me remind you, I mean, the closest thing to a BDFL we had was, uh, was Leamy. Right. And, and he was really only in one area. I, I think Leamy's, the way Leamy pushed Deco, uh, in, in his last year against the resistance of a great many people and not explaining it very well, uh, soured that project for years. And off, some of the people who, this is not true of everyone by any means, but some of the people who say we, you know, we need strategic decision making, what they're sort of saying is, we need DECO. I, li I like the DECO vision. Well, it may be starting to happen, but it, it is actually happening now by committee. So I, the thing is, these are contradictions. I don't know how to resolve them. We can't create a BDFL from, from nothing. It would be hard to build that legitimacy. I think the Plone Foundation has great legitimacy, but the Plone Foundation has its legitimacy in part because it doesn't interfere in development decisions. So it's just tough. And I, I don't have easy answers. And there are going to be limitations to what we can do. Uh, there, you know, we've got advantages and we've got disadvantages. Eric. Closest thing to a BDFL we have now. Right, and that's actually what I wanted to talk about. Um, I, so next week I'm giving a talk on um, kind of the generational turnover we've had in the community. Um, so this kind of, there's been this interesting uh, progression between your talk, your talk, and what, what mine will be. Um, so I, I think, you know, Leamy was not, I mean, obviously he wasn't the BDFL because he hasn't fulfilled the FL part, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what he did uh, was really to uh, have that overview of the entire project, um, and we've kind of lost that for a few years. Um, I'm trying to start, like, I, I paid attention to the code base because yeah. that was my job, yeah. um, but I'm sort of trying to push other areas now, documentation, uh, communications, and things like that, just because somebody needs to do it. And because, as you yeah. said last night, because I'm not on the board, I can actually do things. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I don't want to be 
be the benevolent dictator, but yeah, we, I think we do need to have that higher yeah. level thing. Yeah. And, I very much agree. And, and, I, and I think you're doing a great job, Eric, which oh, you know you. I tell you privately as sure, well. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, uh, thinking on what Kurt said, is the, the thing that Limi was really good at was taking all of that and standing up and saying, this is what's going on, this is what we're gonna do. Um, he famously would write his keynotes before, his state of plone talks immediately before the talk, um, yeah. and half of, it, half, of, half of it would be wrong, but everybody would be excited about what was being said. He was um, a great cheerleader. So, yeah, uh, really, um, we have Christina, um, who's helping me kind of really start push out, start to push out that sort of um, vision and announcements. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, we're we're trying to get back. Yeah, and by the way, let's not over romanticize. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a jumbled mess. Yeah. I was just gonna say, let's not over-romanticize BDFLs because BD, BDFLs have wrecked communities as well as helping build them. It's a very rare skill set to make it work right. Uh, Christina. I have a question. So, the what happened on the IRC channel, so it's kind of got me thinking about whenever there's a new culture, whether it be a company or a country that you're visiting, there's some kind of indoctrination into that. You know, here's what it's about, here's what we stand yeah. for, here are kind of the rules and norms, so to speak. Um, so this might not be the right audience, but I'm asking this because I think this question is very important and I also struggle with it every time I ask a question on IRC. I type it in like six times and then delete it because here's the problem is you don't always know what went wrong to ask an intelligent question. So, and, and this ties in with Luke's question, I mean, with his presentation, is that nobody wants to look stupid. So it, how, can we, how can we go about introducing people into our community in a way that they understand um, how to be an active participant. So, because yeah. I'm still not even clear, like, how do I ask an intelligent question? Yeah. Usually what I do is, like, here's what I did, and then uh, this is what it looks like. But, I mean, I can take yeah. an entire paragraph, and then nobody yeah. reads those either. So, <laughs> um, so I guess yeah. it's kind of two questions. No, it's a, One it's a, is, like, how can I right now tell somebody else who is new, you know, can you, can you rephrase this question so that somebody can help you or I can direct you to someone yeah. who I think can help you? But also the, the bigger question uh, for you developers, the meta question, um, is how can we put all that stuff in a place where the things that are important to us, can we can package it and give it to someone and say, yeah. welcome to the Plone community, here's what it's about. Yeah. This is actually what Eric Raymond was trying to do with some of his, his essays. He maintained the Hacker's Dictionary. Uh, he wrote that essay on how to ask smart questions. And the thing I was ob objecting to, or I was noting was part of that, is that those things also defined a very close culture in the process. Uh, we do need to do those things. Also, I think IRC may be dying as a general way that people communicate to one another as projects start to. So I don't know how much work it's worth doing to solve our IRC problems. But yes, we, in fact, every one of us needs to be involved in rebuilding the community all the time. That includes helping new people come in. And that means when new people come in, we need to help them find the kernel of interest in their question. Uh, because among other things, what they think is going on may not be anything at all like what's wrong with the code. Uh, and you, you have to work through that, and that just requires patience and all of us working together to do it. And it's, you know, it's a real problem when the most impatient of people jump right in and take it over. I, I have no magic answers to these things. I, I don't know if it's a question, but it's more of a comments, and maybe you can uh, give some thoughts on it. Um, going into uh, like understanding the community and how people can kind of uh, contribute, that that directly affects the reciprocity of, of like how the gift economy would work. And if we're not doing that effectively, we don't get the the interaction at all. Yeah. And that's. Yeah, an important part of it too that could be right. A, we, another, we, we want new users. Problem. We want new people to get excited. Uh, 
we, we can't afford to discourage them. Are we okay on time, Kim? Okay, Gabrielle. I, by the way, so, I hope you like my citing French sociologists primarily. Absolutely. Um, I know we are, we're talking a lot about how to bring new people and, and diversity into the community. Um, we're talking, you, t you gave the example of how to bring more women into the programming community. And I would like to talk about how to integrate business people in the community because I fear, I feel as a, the only, maybe one of the few um, business women in this community that mm. it's been extremely hard for um, my um, efforts at contributing uh, to the community uh, to be recognized and, and acknowledged. And I think that, uh, I know I've had many and many conversations about what's happening to the marketing team. Why can't it stay together? Why can't it contribute and, and finally uh, get, get, contribute something useful to the community? What's happening? Um, and I think what's happening, uh, what I've seen and I've seen personally, uh, is that we, um, we, put, we get together, we get excited, we put together a plan, and then we present it to the, to, the, to the community, which is mostly composed of programmers, and we get a quick kick in the butt saying, you know nothing, what w, you know, WTF, and that's it. And that happened to us last, at the last mm -hmm. Bastille Day Sprint last year. We spent many days, many nights, really thinking hard about how to promote Plon, what Plon.com should be. We, I mean, we, we really worked hard. And mm -hmm. then we presented all our findings, and all we got was a, soup, like a series of really short emails from developers saying, well, again, uh, this is crap, this is a piece of shit. So, I mean, again, I'm still happy to help out in the, tomorrow and Saturday, uh, but how do we integrate people who have something to say, who, who have been in the business world for a long time, so that we can all advance Plon? If I had the answer to that. By the way, I, I will just say, I think you may underestimate the extent I mean, we should probably talk more, but the extent to which your uh, contributions are, are known and people do understand them and we wrestle with them and rephrase them. But you're right, there are also people who just weigh in dismissively at the same time. And uh, we should stand up on that, stand up to that. But, but that's, just, that's just a facile answer. I mean, the real work is to be done. Should probably be our last question or comment, I guess, since we do have other things on the schedule. Um, I just want to say two things. First of all, if you're looking for a dictator, there's the man right there. He's done a great job in North Korea. And he's dressed for it. <laughs> Got the crown. You don't have to pay extra money for that or anything. So, yeah. Well, take the good with the bad. I think we, we got a suggestion from over here that he might not qualify as benevolent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know me, which is probably a lot of people, but I used to work here at UW Oshkosh as a developer. Um, I kind of, uh, I, I went back to school after many, many years of work, and uh, so I took it because of things that had happened, you know, between myself and, and the university, um, I took a different job that has nothing to do with computers. And so, uh, Kim invited me back because, you know, I guess I had done some work or whatever the reason. And uh, I, so I came back to this and, and, you know, basically I've been asking myself, what have I been doing here? You know, because I don't have anything to do with computers anymore and, and I mess around at home, but, you know, by the time you get done with work and everything, it's been a long day. So I think your talk has helped me clarify what it is that I'm doing here, you know, and, th and that is the community and, and Plone itself, you know, you struggle every day doing the little things to get to the big picture stuff. And, and I've had bosses tell me that. It's the big picture stuff that keeps you coming to work every day, and, and, I, and I've always kind of agreed with that. And, and Plone is a big picture stuff. I mean, you can 
you know, mess around with code every day, and 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 you may even you know it may even be fun, but it's that man, I got to work on this or I got to work on that, and and so you know, it, it's helped me clarify you know a little bit better why I'm here and what I want to do. So, thanks. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>